Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we are welcoming you to Breaking Into Hollywood, a conversation with Asian American creatives. Um, I'm Aruna Anal Singh, Fuqua 95, and co-chair of the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance. Our affinity group is very proud to be sponsoring this event tonight, mostly because we're so proud of what our Asian and Asian American alumni have achieved. Our timing, though, is coincidental with these ongoing acts of hostilities and aggressions against our community in the US. And we do stand in solidarity with other Duke affinity groups and with other communities that all stand up for anti-racism and we are all advocates for equity to all. It's, it's really important for us to acknowledge that, support each other, and then also on the flip side, um, value the achievements that we've made as we're doing so tonight. Before we begin, I firstly wanted to thank the event co-sponsors, uh, Duke Asian American and Diaspora Studies, Duke Asian Alumni Alliance, Demon, Duke Cinematic Arts, Duke Global Education Office, Duke Create, and Duke Arts. Also, there's a long list of many other people that have supported us. You'll see that list as a thank you later on this evening. I wanted to let you know as a bit of housekeeping that we are recording this Zoom session so that other people will have access to it for streaming on Demon Live. And now we get to the good part, uh, our introductions. I'd like to introduce Amy Kwan, Associate Professor in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and Director of the Asian American and Diaspora Studies at Duke. Amy, why don't you take it away from here? Thanks so much, Aruna. Welcome everyone. Duke's Asian American and Diaspora Studies program is thrilled to be co-hosting this special event in collaboration with all of our co-sponsors tonight. Since ADD's founding three years ago in 2018 and Duke Asian Alumni Alliance's founding in 2019, we have been collaborating on many programs to highlight the stories of Duke's Asian American students and alumni whose forgotten histories reach all the way back to the very foundational years of Duke University. This event is part of the Asian American Pacific Pacific Islander Heritage Month commemorations, which is in May, but celebrated at Duke throughout April each year. Stay tuned after tonight's conversation to find out more about our upcoming Heritage Month programs and also for the big reveal of the lucky winner of our raffle. Now, it's my honor to introduce the moderator of our event who has done an incredible job bringing the esteemed panelists together tonight. Daniel Kim is a graduating senior majoring in theater studies. He's also an aspiring screenwriter and filmmaker in the Studio Duke program and the recipient of the 2020 Benenson Award in the Arts and the Janet B. Chang Grant for his screenplay, Hollywood Asian. We're really looking forward to reading his screenplay and seeing it on screen soon. He also writes for Phi Beta Kappa's Key Reporter and has been busy rehearsing to play Jason in the theater department's spring production of Medea. Daniel is also a proud member of the ads staff team, and I'd like to just give a big shout out to all of the other team members who have made this event possible. Derek, Shania, Brenda, Shawin, and Ryan, and also to Amy Unell and all of her team at Demon. So with that, I turn it over to you, Daniel. Thanks so much for that, Professor Kwan. I'm excited to be in conversation today with this all-star panel of Duke alumni. Please post any questions you may have for the panelists in the Q&A. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, starting with Gita Patel, class of 1998, who is an Emmy-nominated writer and director who has worked on Meet the Patels in shows including The Great, The Mindy Project, Fresh Off the Boat. Hey. Next, we have King Lu, who is the class of 2015, a screenwriter and director and winner of the 2020 Humanitas College Drama Fellowship for his script from June to July. Hey, everybody. We also have Winnie Katzenstein, Fuqua class of 2003, who's vice president of marketing strategy for Funimation at Sony Pictures Television. Hi, all. And to round out our panel, we have Angela Zhou, class of 2014, actress with roles in the Oscar nominated movie Promising Young Woman and the show Hell on Wheels. Be sure to check out the full bios on the registration page. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. So for the first question, everyone will have a chance to answer. So speaking from outside the industry, 
It seems that Hollywood is giving more attention to Asian American narratives, recent examples being movies like Minari and Raya. How have you perceived these changes within entertainment as Asian American professionals and how has this impacted your career? And Angela, I would love to have your thoughts on this first. First thoughts. Um, I think it's great. I think it's really exciting. Uh, it definitely makes it easier to feel like you can actually pitch ideas that are with Asian American leads in them. And I feel like, I hope at least that in the future of financing these sorts of ideas won't seem so crazy and that it might lead to more of them actually. Awesome. How about uh, you, Wendy, from the business perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's, I've been in entertainment for 20 some years and, and working in the multicultural space actually um, for quite some time. And it's actually pretty gratifying. I wouldn't say it's perfect by any means, but I think we've gotten to a point where there are a lot of narratives that aren't around proving that there's a business case here. I think people are actually beginning to recognize and realize what the power of um, these stories and the representation can do for the business. So I actually, I have a little bit of optimism. We're moving in the right direction. Yay, that sounds good. Uh, and Gita, do you share this optimism? I definitely share uh, optimism. I also, I think, still think that we should keep the pressure on the industry. I feel like we don't want Asians to just be sidekicks and um, we don't want to look at a cast where it's like, you know, united colors. Like, I think we want to still tell stories of Asian families, Asian groups of friends. Uh, there's just so much left to do. And I think that needs to be done in the commercial space. It's happening in the independent space. The independent space has always been welcoming of, of our voices, uh, everybody's voices, uh, just because of the nature of independent film and television. But I think we still need to keep the pressure on, on in the commercial space. Mm. Yeah, definitely keeping the pressure on. And how about you, King? Yeah, I definitely agree with what everybody has said. Um, I think, uh, you know, obviously I haven't been in this uh, for as long as Gita and Wenny, um, but I, I remember when I was first uh, telling people that I wanted to be a writer director, everybody's first reaction was like, oh, like Wang Fu. Um, I think <laughs> times have definitely changed uh, since that like eight or nine years ago. Um, you know, there's so many more comparisons. There's so many more filmmakers who are making work. Um, it's really cool because I have projects that I've, and trying to pitch, you know, like a basketball story and everybody's like, oh, it's kind of like Boogie or, you know, a family drama the, from June to July um, and it's similar to Minari and it's cool to have those people to look to and that those projects are getting made and that it's actually possible. Um, but definitely there still needs to be some more progress. Um, and I guess just thinking about the definition of progress, uh, if there's a problem and it's been rectified, then you're only undoing the problem and you haven't actually made actual progress yet. Wow, yeah, thank you. I totally agree about the diversity of stories um, in the Asian American space. And yeah, thank you all for your insights in the industry as it is today. It'll be super helpful for those of us who are transitioning to enter entertainment, including me. And speaking about entertainment, um, Gita, you began your career in finance and made the transition to Hollywood as an associate screenwriter, if that's correct. And so when did you decide to pursue your passion for storytelling? How did you manage this transition? Um you know, it's, it's interesting because I was just thinking about this yesterday. I, when I graduated, which I, I think a lot of people probably feel this when they graduate a school like Duke, I felt a lot of pressure to get a job where I make a lot of money or one day would make a lot of money, get a job that looked great on my resume, make my parents proud. My parents are immigrants. They came to America with nothing. I mean, there was just so much of that. And I also felt the pressure to pick exactly what I was going to do. And because I felt like whatever you picked after college is what you did for the rest of your life, which now at 45 years old is hilarious, like such a joke, because it's not true. Um, you know, I was just telling somebody yesterday, I think what I've learned, you know, as I keep growing up is when you, you know, every moment of your life, you pick a lane. And when that doesn't work, you switch to the next lane and you just keep switching. And maybe your life is a journey of switching. Maybe your life is you find a lane you like. It's not, it's not the same thing as love. You know, you're not married to this one thing forever. I didn't know all that. So when I graduated, I took a job from the on-campus interviews, um, the job fair, I think, and it was in finance. And I 
always knew that I wanted to be in storytelling, but I couldn't figure out if it was a hobby because in my culture, from where I come from, um, nobody was in the arts and every anything artsy was a hobby. And so I went to New York and I started this job working for General Electric in their FMP program, um, which some of you might be familiar with that are watching. And it's a hardcore program where you're getting kind of your MBA and teach uh, and working. And after two years, my father said to me, I just want to see you smile. I haven't seen my daughter smile. And I had written so many letters to people in Los Angeles. I had used the Duke in LA program. I'd been in the career center looking up people. I don't know if that's still there, but like, you know, there are all these people that were part, I don't think Demon was around then, but I, there were so many resources at Duke that I was using. Um, Dave Carger, who's still head of the group, was someone who helped me. And so all these people kind of came together and I was able to jump over to LA uh, through, I must have written like 200 letters. I had them all in a binder. But one of those letters got me my first job as a writer's assistant on a television show. So anyway, that, that's how it happened. I, and I don't regret a single minute of it. I think the finance thing needed to happen. I think there's a path. You know, it doesn't, I think the biggest thing is I was under the false impression that anybody who just went straight to LA and, or, you know, regardless, just immediately went into the arts, they deserve to be in the arts. And I don't think life is that simple. I think whether you're 40 years old, 50 years old, whatever, you know, when it's time, it's time and you follow your heart. Wow. Thank you for that. I love that. I know my parents are watching, so I'm glad they're <laughs> Yeah, give me the 50 bucks. Where's my 50 bucks? <laughs> um, wow. Okay. And uh, so the, the next question um, is for Wenny. Uh, and um, I, I, a lot of us are curious about, uh, I know I have a lot of friends who are interested in marketing, uh, about yeah. what the daily life and responsibilities as a vice president of marketing strategy at Funimation Sony Pictures. And I know this is, you probably can't talk about this, but what types of projects can you work on? <laughs> And, yeah, uh, actually, so I just want to point out, Gita, I think you and I are the same age and have a very similar experience in the sense that, yes, <laughs> my parents are immigrants and uh, I like to call myself the black sheep of the family because everybody else is, you know, in science and math. And actually, my sister's professor at Duke um, and, and really great at what she does. Um, I also wanted to be a storyteller, but I'm clearly not as creatively minded as the rest of my esteemed panelists. And so the way that I've actually approached storytelling is through the process of marketing. So um, I, I don't create ads. What I actually do, um, and in particular in the role that I play here at Funimation, but also what I did for Disney and NBC Universal is I'm creating lifestyle brands. I am literally taking the art and the work that the really great creative people do and finding those emotional connections with fans and people to give them a space to, to be together. So um, I'm very fortunate to be now working in the medium of anime, which I have discovered is a, an amazing entertainment platform that helps people self-care. It gives them opportunities around discovering identity. Um, and so it's a really lovely opportunity to actually storytell, but in a slightly different way from Gita. So I spend a lot of time doing exactly that, explaining to people, storytelling, developing um, programs and platforms and executions that allow fans to be able to annex that and, and hopefully make it part of their lives. Wow, that is cool. I, I should check out marketing. Thank you for sharing. Come on. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and Angela, so you had an acting role in Promising Woman, which I am excited to see soon, and received five Oscar nominations. So can you tell us your experiences getting and filming this role and what are some of the essentials that are important to you in deciding your next project? Um, well, it's a rather like convoluted process when it comes to, you know, getting the roles, but generally speaking, it starts off with an audition. And, but for the smaller roles, oftentimes actually, I realized afterwards that most of the movie in the independent film is offers already. So I didn't realize that I was one of the very few people that actually auditioned for the movie. Most of the people were already in it from the beginning, were in it when people were there to green light it, to get it all booked out. And there were only a, like a handful of us who actually auditioned for it. And so when that actually happens, they don't send out to a bunch of auditions. So it goes to 
the people that the casting director already knows very deeply. So this casting director is a woman who I think is a big, um, is a is a is a big sort of a cheerleader of mine even though I've only met her once and that's because I think the first time I met her at an audition um, we went straight to the callbacks and we met I met her while I met the director and the producers so because of that when the smaller roles came along she sent it my way I read the script and I was just blown away by it um, I think you know having done a lot of development internships and reading a lot of scripts I've realized that actually it's no matter the race or gender of any actor it's very rare that you find something that is incredibly well written entertaining and then also has meaningful conversation to bring that's fresh so when I saw that I was like okay have to get on this project Wow, that is so cool. Actually, I think my production company mentioned that they they saw a promising woman and then um, as the script, and they passed on it. But they're like, oh, like this, it was good, just didn't fit their brand. That is so cool, though. That um, yeah, I know it's so interpersonal based. Um, and now King, uh, I know a lot of my friends and I were trying to make short films before you graduate. So, what is something about filmmaking that you didn't know about writing and directing your first film after Duke? And what projects are you working on right now? Um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully this hopefully this is simple um, to people. Uh, but I think one thing that I definitely didn't really think about when I was making shorts at Duke, and I didn't really realize until uh, I got out of school, was just thinking a lot more about how to create an experience with the film and sort of have an interaction with the audience and thinking about kind of the effect that the shots will have on the audience. So again, I think this hopefully should sound like pretty basic about like what a film is, but I think. Uh, especially because I think at Duke, a lot of um, the classes were geared towards exper experimental filmmaking. So I think when I was an undergrad, a lot of it was just like, what do I want to make? Like, what's the story that I want to tell? And like, what kind of shots do I want to use to tell that? Instead of thinking about like, oh, you know, like if I have a shot of somebody walking down the street and then you smash cut to a shot of blood splattering against the wall, like that has an effect on somebody. Like the audience is like sitting forward and they're a lot more interested in what's going to happen. And uh, you can sort of play them like a cat with a string or something. Uh, although not like intentionally trying to be demeaning towards audiences, but um, that that's really like what directing really is. Uh, and in terms of projects that I'm working on, you know, I mentioned um, uh, the basketball project. Um, it's about an Asian and black kid who start hustling in the streets playing basketball. So it's kind of a, a new spin on uh, white men can't jump. And, uh, and then there's also this political thriller that I've been working on as a feature. Wow, excited to see those. And you can definitely check out King Lu's old shorts um, on his website, King Lu Films. They're pretty good. Um, so we've heard from every panelist so far, uh, but now I'd like to go around and do a rapid fire set of questions that every Duke student is wondering. And I'm going to ask you to do this in a couple of sentences or less. The first question is, share the most challenging and the most rewarding aspect of your job. So. I'll start with King and then I'll go around from there. Okay, uh, so the most challenging, I think it's definitely the uncertainty, uh, how in unstable kind of uh, the career can be. And then the most rewarding is, it's pretty much the greatest job you could have. And you, get to, <laughs> you get to wake up and just dream stories and create dream worlds. Uh, what's more fun than that? Well, my parents won't be happy about the uncertainty thing, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Gita, uh, Gita, sorry, <laughs> can you go next? Yeah, I would say the most challenging is the politics um, of the business and the most rewarding is the impact of the art. And how about Wendy? Um, I think from my perspective right now, um, I think entertainment was one of the last industries to truly get disrupted by tech. So our, the challenge is figuring out what that impact is on on how we go to market and how we keep things, not just the everyday blockbuster, but things that keep it fresh and interesting, which I think this team obviously spends a lot of work on. And I think the most rewarding part is when you are actually able to push through something emotionally. Again, 10, 15 years ago, I was desperately trying to get Disney to think more broadly about characters and representation. And I was so gratified, you know, say what you want about the production of Mulan, but the fact that my kids can actually see, you know, a really strong female 
Asian character, um, those are the things that are most gratifying. Just sometimes takes a little bit longer. Wow. And uh, Angela. Yeah, so I totally echo everybody's sentiment about the ups and downs and everything. But I think no matter what career you pick, you're gonna have the bad days. And I think on any of the bad days, what really helps you get through is an overarching goal and sort of a belief that you're where you wanna be in terms of making the impact that you wanna make in the world. And so I think on my worst days, it's really when I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's any impact at all, you know, we see all the, all the Asian hate around and I'm like, gosh, have we been able to create any of the empathy that I've been hoping that this has all been about, you know? And it makes me wonder if I would have more impact if I went into a startup for green energy instead. Um, but then on those days, I remind myself that, that those aren't the skills that I was given, you know, probably an engineer would do better at advancing that and that we all play our own little part in the world and we push our little part forward. Um, and then on the best days is obviously when you're on set and you're just like killing it and you're suddenly realizing, oh my gosh, all my skills fit perfectly into this job and it's all working out well. And, you know, sometimes it's amazing when you hear from people who say that you, whatever little art you made sort of help them connect with their own family members during a difficult period or something, you know, so that's great. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Um, for that. And for the second question, um, if you were to do Duke again, or Fuqua, uh, what is one thing you did or would have done differently to prepare for your life post-graduation, knowing what you know now? And I'll start with Wenny. Or you can, I can. Uh, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> such a, I, I've got to be honest, um, I had such a phenomenal experience at Fuqua. I don't think I would change anything that was part of that experience. I mean, I think we are a very fortunate group of, of people at the business school that are just a uniquely tight, high culture. Um, you know, there's a reason why we call it Team Fuqua. And, and I think that even though the majority of my classmates aren't in entertainment, I had a lot of support and a lot of, um, a lot of you know, great opportunity there, even though that's not necessarily the focus. So I wouldn't, I don't know that I would change anything or do anything differently. So what is, uh, what is one thing you did that helped you a lot? Either one thing you did or one thing you would do differently? Yeah, I mean, I think it's what probably everybody would say just about um, being in business and it particularly being in entertainment is mm. use every aspect of your network, um, your Duke network, your Fuqua network, your undergrad, your family, like that's, that's how you make it, how, that's how it works, I think, in this business. Yeah, very interpersonal based. Do the Duke Alumni Network is very strong as well. Very strong. Um, yeah. So King, um, what about you? And this can be for your Columbia MFA program as well. Oh, uh, I mean, I can answer it for Duke. Um, mm. I think one thing that I was really happy I did is uh, I made a lot of shorts and just was always trying to shoot stuff. Um, even during the summer, like I stayed in Durham a few, I think second year and third year, like I just stayed in around and like found actors and started shooting stuff through Freewire Productions, um, which is the filmmaking group at Duke. Uh, I think if I would have done one thing differently, I would have maybe tried to do Duke in LA and do an internship and just have a better sense of the outside world and uh, like what the business is like so that I could have sort of a better understanding of what, what that looks like. Okay, cool, thank you. And actually Duke in LA is where I first met Angela. Um, and speaking of Angela, what do you think? I so echo Wenny's sentiment about like, I just loved my time at Duke so much. It was such heaven that, you know, if you think of the butterfly effect, if you change one thing, like who knows what you would have changed, you know? But in the hypothetical world of, you know, what maybe I could have done more, because I did Duke in New York and Duke in LA. And then I was a Robertson scholar. So I did another semester away from UNC. I didn't, you know, the time that I did actually spend at Duke I spent it all trying to make the most of my friends and the experience and then learning as much. So I, looking back, I didn't get to make a feature film, you know, or the short films that I made were not of a quality that I could show anyone today. Like I didn't realize that, you know, I finished it with two feature length screenplays and one of them I sort of rewrote a little bit and put it into the Sundance Writers Lab and it got into like the final round. But in that round, they want you to, 
they prefer people to also put in a short film that they've directed because the only way to get into the directing program is through the writing program, right? So I was like, gosh, if I had made something that I could have actually put in there, then like my actual application for that maybe would have been better. Um, but like I said, that would have required time out of something else. So I don't know, but I would say having something that you actually show that doesn't look like it's student film quality, something that you could put in would be great. Mm. Wow, that's very helpful. Uh, and Gita, how about you? Um, as far as what I think was, you know, a great thing that I that helped me in the long term, I, I feel like I took advantage. I tried to take advantage of everything Duke had to offer, career wise. I uh, as much as I could. I I was always in that resource center or whatever it was, job center. And I was always reaching out to people, always learning from alumni. I would fly out to LA and meet them, just talk to them. I didn't ask them for anything. It was just a really beautiful part of what Duke had to offer, especially not being a school where, you know, we had it we, at the time, I don't know about now, but we didn't have a huge arts program. Um, the one thing I have to be honest about is I actually had a really hard time in college. Um, I struggled with my identity a lot. I struggled being first born in the United States. I struggled with marriage uh, because in my culture, we marry within the culture. And it was just a lot of things that connected with uh, my going into the arts because it was just another fail, you know? And I, I think the one thing that maybe I would do more of if I, you know, if I was gonna go back and this is one of those things I think everybody would probably say is, um, you know, I had very low self-esteem and you need, that's something we all need to work on, most of us that are human as we grow up, but especially going into the arts, it's something that really kind of was my biggest challenge becoming a director. Like if you met me back then, you would never think that I would be a director and I would have never told you I was gonna be a director. I was absolutely like a mess. So I think I, think I would have you know, tried to seek more counseling, tried to really work on myself, tried to kind of get clear. But then again, I mean, you're in college, you know, how much, that's just part of growing up, so. <laughs> wow, thank you for being so honest about that though. I know a lot of college students definitely struggle and there are resources out there like CAPS and um, group therapy sessions I know are, that people should definitely work out, uh, reach out to. Um, but thank you so much for that, yeah. And thank you guys for doing these rapid fire questions. I know it's hard to answer in a concise um, a period of time, but I think we have some more time for a couple more individual questions. Uh, the next question is uh, actually for Gita again. So what are some of the differences and similarities to directing documentaries and directing scripted projects such as Superstore or the Game of Thrones prequel, House of Dragon, that I saw? Um, the, the documentary world is mainly independent. Uh, please, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but at least my experience has been independent. And with that, there's wonderful things. First of all, independent is where it's at. I always will say that. I just think it's where we get to be what we want to be. It's, um, you know, there's not a million notes coming down on you from somewhere that, that may not have to do with what you're really doing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, documentaries for me are, you know, that's one of the biggest things is that you are a free bird on some level. You are also broke. Most of the time, I didn't have a car until five years ago when I started directing commercial television and film. Um, so there's that part of it that's hard. And also just the, the prep process is completely different. When you're doing a documentary, there's a myriad of, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know, I mean, you, you can't really tell people what to do if you're doing a pure documentary. You're, you're following the story. And each of my docs took eight years uh, because you're waiting for something to happen. With, with commercial or you know, scripted, uh, whether it be independent or not, there's a level of preparation that's really important. You've got a crew with you. You've got, uh, you know, you've got to know how you're going to shoot uh, a scene. Of course, Nomadland is a complete, you know, kind of a, a, a different part of that. Nomadland is actually a great example of, of putting the two together in a lot of ways, but most of my work in television is a lot of communication, a lot of preparation, 
a lot of storyboarding or um, diagrams of this is where the camera is going to go. You're going to go here. And the luxury when you come when you go from documentaries to scripted, the awesome luxury is like all of a sudden you can tell people what to do. Like, you know, with documentaries, you can't. But with scripted, it's almost like it feels like offensive. You're like, hey, can you like stand here and then go there and cry? You know what I mean? It's like everything's just so controlled. So it's pretty rad when you have that that transition. But I think with scripted, there are, are so many other challenges um, that are amazing, like just the camera work, the the ambition of storytelling, you know, all of that. Uh, I could go on forever, obviously, about this. I mean, it's just there there is a huge difference. But I think the greatest part of it that's a similarity is you're working with beautiful artists. I think working with actors in scripted and working with non-actors in documentaries, my technique is pretty much the same. Nothing really changed. And it is my greatest joy. Like it is the number one thing that if you don't like working with people and particularly actors who are just so filled with like genius, then I personally don't think it's worth being a director. I don't think you hide behind the camera. Wow. And my next question is for Angela, who is an actress. Um, <laughs> how did you get uh, the process of getting an agent or forming these relationships with this casting director that helped you get these types of roles? That is the big question that most of the most of the Duke graduates call me about. Um, but it's it's really just it's like a long process. What you don't realize is like so many so many actors in this business are kid actors and then their parents are also in it. And a lot of that is because the just the business is so opaque and even like thinking about a potential corporate ladder is it's very difficult to know. And then once you get that big break, there are big issues of like taxes and unions and you know residuals, all of that stuff that brings up the financial element of being able to like push you forward longer. So um, it's a lot. So you know for anybody out there who wants to be an actor, call me and especially like before you take your big role or anything you're about to sign the sign the deal call me about that stuff and I can go into more details but for me it was um I did a lot of acting in high school that then led to me winning some competitions in like um, acting mainly but also a little bit of the directing and the writing stuff and through that they did a, a whole New Zealand casting for this movie that then I became the director's number one choice for but ultimately the producers thought I was too old for it but because I had met a bunch of friends through doing like the globe stuff I went and I trained at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London for a bit they had reps and I went to their reps. I didn't even ask them about it, but I just like cold, cold emailed these reps. Um, they rep Lucy Lawless as well. And I was like, I'm a huge fan of Lucy Lawless. And like, I'm friends with blah and blah. I know you rep them. And I just did this program with them. And also I was in this, this feature you hear that they're casting. I was like the, the director's choice for that. If you want to go like ask the director about that, he said he'd like vouch. Um, and so they're like, oh, sure. Come in for like a, an interview. And then I went in for an interview and they signed me. And then a couple of months, um, well, one month later, I was like, oh, my bad, I'm going to Duke. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, my bad, I'm going to go to college. Um, and I was like, oh, but you know, I'd love to audition when I come back in the summers for anything, if you have anything available. So what happened was then one summer I booked it. My first time I had enough time to come back. I was lucky I booked an international McDonald's commercial because it was New Zealand and Australia. And then when I moved to LA at that point, I had, oh, in Duke and LA, I took screen acting classes on the side. I took a screen acting class back in New Zealand for my original acting, for my original New Zealand agents. And then it meant that by the time I actually landed in LA, I had a demo reel, I had headshots, I had a resume, and I sent out cold emails to people in town with the subject title, like Asian female speaks fluent Chinese, <laughs> speaks fluent Cantonese Mandarin. And then I was like international McDonald's commercial. <laughs> and then that's what happened. Yeah, and people, I, I got signed in like a, a couple of weeks. Wow, that sounds like a real hustle. Um... Good for, yeah, I mean, hopefully- A really I'll long convoluted story, story right? <laughs> yeah. Like kind of not just like I showed up to LA and was like, what's the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, I think that's, uh, that, that comforts, I think a lot of people um, knowing that every person's story is individual and it's gonna be their own. Um, and 
we'll come back to the individual questions in a moment for Wenny and King next. But uh, I wanted to make sure that we get to this question, which is another question for all. Um, as Asian Americans, the model minority stereotype and the perpetual foreigner syndrome are built into perceptions of who we are. So for those of you who may not be familiar, the perpetual foreigner syndrome is being constantly perceived as foreign or other and thus unassimilable to America. And we have seen these perceptions lead to an escalation of violence and discrimination against Asians during the COVID pandemic. So what role can artists or media professionals play in combating these stereotypes? And how has this impacted your work in the industry or how will it in the future? Um, so we can start with, uh, if we can start with Wenny, um, and then I'll go around. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Like I said, I mean, years ago, it was a, a lot of focus on the business case to even have representation. I think that increasingly across business, whether you're in entertainment or not, it's putting your money where your mouth is. It's not enough to make a statement. So um, at least at Funimation and within Sony, we've had a lot of conversations about what this looks like. I can tell you um, within our own organization, the, the sense of being able to support our internal teams on having dialogue on how to you know, even in, be an ally. Um, our, our big conversations that we are really trying to figure out how to support even internally our opportunities there so that we can actually um, push that out amongst our fans as well. It's hard, it's hard to be credible about making a statement if you don't take care of your house first. And so we are spending a lot of time um, understanding how to best support um, our internal organization so that we can have that level of credibility. Wow, yeah, those conversations are very important. Yeah. Um, and King, uh, what is your response to the question? Uh, yeah, I think my response would be pretty straightforward. Just I think there, um, as more and more creators and people in the business side have more opportunities, um, I think as we tell our stories, uh, that's going to help change people's perceptions. And when I say that as well, I also believe that uh, as creators, like we have to be free to tell whatever stories we want to tell. Um, and that includes like, if you're an Asian filmmaker and you don't want to make a film about Asian people, I think that's fine as well. And if you want to portray Asians, I mean, there are good Asians, there's bad Asians, you know, there's flaws and warts and everything. Um, so I don't think it's just like, oh, we need to have like Asian heroes, which is great. Um, but then also like have room for, you know, films that show some of the flaws as well. Um, I think just the more freedom and the more people who have the opportunity to do that, the better. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and Gita. Oh, I think you're muted. Ha, huh, sorry. I feel like the, you know, Mulan is a great example of uh, a forward moving, uh, you know, step with all of this. I think what I learned in working in documentaries is that it's very easy to preach to the choir. So make, it's really easy to make something that where your audience already is on board. But I think the greatest form, uh, the greatest vehicle for social justice messages are actually our big commercial uh, four quadrant films. I, I think Marvel, DC Comics. I mean, when I traveled around the world with the State Department particularly, um, in their film program, I was so upset because of course nobody wanted to watch my film and it wasn't that great, but nobody wanted to watch a documentary in general. Everybody wanted to watch an action film from the United States. And I think that's where the money's at is like to reach audiences who are somehow related to those people that are expressing hate on the street to, to teach them in a way that they can understand, which is through the stuff that they watch, the stuff they absorb, the stuff that, you know, I, I was embedded with troops where they were watching our action films before going out and unfortunately shooting, you know, guerrilla fighters in a war zone. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, there's just all this opportunity in that market. I'm not saying everyone needs to go into commercial film or commercial television, but I think it's just a practical thing. Like there is a vehicle for social justice in mainstream media. And so, I mean, I've pretty much committed my my life to that now. Like that's all I wanna do is figure out a way to make a difference through what I can't help but just submit to, which is people wanna watch fun stuff on TV that, you know, so how do we get to them? Yeah, the impact of media, especially on our perceptions of people is really underestimated. 
And oh, Angela, yes, do you have something? No, a hundred percent. I love what Gita said because, in fact, like that was one of the things. The Great, the show that she was on, I loved that so much that I literally had to email her afterwards. I was like, "That was so great! Can't believe I saw your name afterwards." Because <laughs> that's like exactly the same as in what I loved about Promising Young Woman as well. It's about entertaining people. That that should be the minimum. And then if you're actually able to stoke up the conversation, that's that's like when you're in that perfect sweet spot that's so rare because um, I made my major in politics, economics and creative media at Duke, a program too. And through that, I actually learned that a lot of the issues in our world, they don't have to do with logic and you trying to explain to people, you're trying to change people's minds. You know, I took a class called political psychology and then another um, decision neuroscience class where they were talking about basically like the theory is now that when you start engaging people's logic, no matter what you give them, they're going to interpret new facts through the lens of what they already believe. Like that's why political lawn signs are the dumbest thing to have because the more lawn signs you put up, instead of changing people's minds, it entrenches them in whoever they already believe in, right? So through those classes, they were saying the way to really change people's hearts is to actually get at them emotionally. When they're, in, when they're not using that logical side of the brain, but when they're going through more of their automatic side, when their body's kind of just relaxing. And so that means when they're watching entertaining things in their spare time, or even if it's just like being exposed to people from different backgrounds as themselves, like one of the reasons why Hell on Wheels was such a special thing now looking back um, for my first big break is that it was a show whose demographic was the railroad of America. So the demo, we used to joke on set that we sold Chevys and Viagra to like the middle of the country because that was the demo. But then in their final season, they decided to write about the other half of the building of the transcontinental railroad. And it was the first time the Chinese workers were ever talked about from a leading actor perspective there. And from, I, I can't imagine how many people were introduced to Chinese like Chinese immigrants and their plight in America through that and who would have never tuned in if it was just originally sold as that. Yeah, no, as a, as a teaching, as a way of teaching, that's really amazing that media is able to do that. And so now, yeah, we have more time for individual questions. So I'll go to um, Wenny uh, and going back to Fuqua, how did you try to maximize your skills in professional development for the creative industries? Uh, this is somewhat similar to the previous questions, but. Um, well, so in full, full disclosure, um, I started in entertainment and then I went to business school thinking uh, I was going to be a good Asian child and um, go into marketing and sell mac and cheese because that seemed like a more stable sort of approach. Um, and and I, I did that for the summer. I did an internship and quickly realized when I looked at the passion of my classmates around, you know, facings and color palettes, and, and I thought, oh my God, it's leaving me completely dead inside. So you know, I too completely understand where you're coming from, from your G example. Um, and so I decided to go back into entertainment um, and it was a weird time to do it. It was uh, 2003 is the year that I graduated. It was a rough time in the market. It was a rough time to do anything that was sort of non-traditional, but you know, the networking piece was a huge part of it. And then in terms of just thinking about how to break into the business, um, you know, at the end of the day, all these guys on the panel are doing amazing creative work, but somebody still needs to go out there and make it monetizable and commercial. And so um, I took a lot of the skill sets that I learned in the process of being an MBA and I applied it to the opportunities that were in front of me for entertainment. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Follow your passion, do it, everyone who's watching. Um, and for King, there are many paths to becoming a screenwriter, uh, as well as there are many paths to becoming a director like Angela suggested earlier. And I'm aware that you, you, we went, you went to Columbia's MFA program for directing and writing. So what are a few tips for students or alumni hoping to establish themselves as screenwriters for directors? And would you suggest graduate school for pursuing a career in, enter in entertainment? Yeah, thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but I think if I could give an overarching tip, um, it's that you really have to figure it out for yourself. Um, and one thing that I remember is like, I actually took uh, 
um, a film studies course with James Seamus, who used to run Focus Features and work with Ang Lee. Um, and then uh, twice a year, he would have a 10 minute Q&A at the beginning of class where people could ask him questions. And he kind of turned it into an exercise because basically whatever people asked him, it's like, hey, like, should I just go and make a bunch of movies? He's like, yeah, you could do that. But then when do you have time to reflect on making films? You're saying, oh, so I should like, you know, like just sit down and take out a notebook and reflect on making film. He's like, well, but then you're not going to go make anything. And he's, he's just kind of being because he's just like, oh, you know, there is no real path. I can sit here and give you a bunch of tips about, you know, go make movies, go watch movies, go read books in the library about movies, go read books, like all of that. Um, but I think ultimately everybody is different. And, you know, as you've already seen from that, what all the panelists have talked about, um, everybody has kind of a different path to where they're going to get to and everybody has different strengths. Um, so I think just sort of play to that. Um, I guess the one other tip that I would give is um, ultimately you do have to stick with it, I think. And uh, I heard this, uh, one of my friends told this to me the other day that I thought was really funny and really true is that if you stick with it long enough, eventually like all of your competition uh, will probably drop out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's something to look forward to. Um, so if you just stick with it, like I think ultimately you find your place. Um, and uh, in terms of going to film school, I think it depends. You know, I think you have to know why you want to do it. And I think you also have to be prepared for that tough question. Um, I know when I first went to film school, the first month I was just, you know, like questioning myself, like, what am I doing? This is insane. Like, how much debt am I going into? Why would I possibly do this? Um, but I think, you know, the more time I spent actually going to film school and, and you know, remembering why I made that choice, um, I realized ultimately that it was good and I would definitely do it again. Um, but I think, you know, it depends for some people, it depends on your situation and what you kind of want to get out of it. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. I've been getting that question a lot. And speaking about getting questions from our audience, we will now open up our conversation to the Q&A that they have submitted. Um, so continuing on this individual path and learning from those, um, Gita, can you talk about how you started as a writer's assistant and shifted to directing? And did it feel like that this was your calling that you were meant to do as a storyteller, ultimately as a director? When I was at Duke, I was, even before, I was always obsessed with storytelling. And the because of the limitations of my family, um, kind of expectations, the, the one thing I could do where I wasn't messing anything up was write. So that was the thing I focused on. I think if you asked me back then, what was I interested in? I was interested in everything. You know, I would do anything. <laughs> I would have acted, I would have done anything, but that all required a lot more logistics. But the one thing I could do without anyone knowing was just write. So I did that and I wrote and wrote and wrote. And when I got this writer's assistant job, it was because I took all these trips out to LA, wrote a ton of letters, just like so many people on this panel and just, you know, hustled as much as I could and then got this job as a writer's assistant, not knowing anything about what it meant. And so I'm working on this television show and learning some program on a computer of what helps them do all the different pages that are in different colors. And I'm on set and I, I could just cry right now telling you how happy I was in that moment. It was the coolest thing. It still is when I walk on a set, it was just magical. And so I just, you know, for the next um, four or five years was a writer's assistant. And the man I worked for took me with him to, to do production rewrites. So a production rewrite is when you have a big action film, like we worked on all the rock movies, Fast and the Furious, Blue Crush, and we would be the team. My, boss would be the main person who would do a quick rewrite for like two to three weeks and get that film into what we call green light, like ready to shoot. So we did that. And there is a point to my story. I promise I'll answer it. The question at some point, my, it had been, I think it had been five, six years. And my boss came to me and he said, his name's Carrie O'Salem. And he said, Gita, you've been hiding behind me for all these years. He's like, what, what are you doing? Like, are you just gonna be my assistant your whole life? Like you can't, I can't make you a writer. And the truth is that I was completely, and a lot of people will feel this when they come to LA, it's very intimidating. And I was so intimidated by all the talented people. I just didn't think I had it. I mean, I think deep down. And also I didn't know my own voice because like as King was saying, you know, sometimes you're either 
working or you're or you're writing, but it's hard to negotiate the both. And as an assistant, you're working all the time. So I hadn't written anything in five, six years. I didn't even know who I was. So because my boss said that, I went home and I realized, okay, I need to um, excuse my language, shit or get off the pot, you know, like make a decision. <laughs> And so I went home and I started writing and writing and I it turned into a novel. And then I, I did what is the advice I'd give anyone listening right now is I followed my bliss for the first time in my life, really. And my bliss took me to writing a novel. The novel was set in a war zone. I went to the war zone in Kashmir. I saw that people were dying in a vacuum, picked up a camera, started filming, didn't know how to use a camera, found some friends who knew how to use a camera, made a documentary, um, you know, took eight years to make it. All I knew was that in those moments, I was happy. I had no clue what I was doing. At some point, I'm at the Sundance Labs and they're talking to me about how I'm a director. And I'm like, oh, I'm directing. Okay. Like I, you know what I'm saying? And it, so that's how it happened. But it happened through following my bliss. It didn't happen through saying, I want to be famous. I want to be this. I want to be you know, I need to make money. It wasn't about any of that. It was actually about just going in a direction that made me happy. And I've said this before to so many Duke students, um, and, you know, and, and to myself is, I don't think happiness is making money at being an artist. I don't think happiness is being famous. Happiness is being happy, enjoying. You can have that right now, wherever you are, whether you're, you know, doing it on the side or whatever, like, Anyway, that has that doesn't answer the question. But anyway, that's that's how it happened. And now I, I will tell you that even though I am a director and I'm doing Game of Thrones and all this stuff, I am no happier today than I was back then. Like I promise you. Wow, I really appreciate that authentic answer. Um, and uh, I, I've gotten a couple comments saying they really appreciate you being so uh, authentic and upfront about your experiences. Um, and so King, this next question is directed towards you. Uh, how do you write your stories? And so this person says they have trouble balancing tropes and cliches and making fiction believable. And uh, other people can feel free to jump in on this too. He, he or she would love to know your process and coming up with ideas and how you put those ideas onto paper. Uh, wow, that's a tough question. Um, I think I'm just draw. I, I try to draw a lot from start from like real life incidents. I guess um, I think ultimately everything you write kind of relates to your own life. Um, although obviously, hopefully, it will become something more than that. Um, but I try just try to pull from experiences that I have and the emotions that I feel relating to those experiences. So, you know, the script that I wrote from June to July um, was about a real life uh, voting accident that happened within my community when I was growing up and to see like how that uh, aftershock kind of rippled through the community and all the relationships. That was something that I knew I definitely wanted to write about at some point in my life. Um, so I worked on that for a few years. Um, and you know, and I always played basketball. So I always kind of knew what it felt like to walk onto the court as an Asian kid and, and see how people look at you and what they perceive about you. So that again was another inspiration. And I think that helps as well to avoid tropes because um, you know, it's your own life, like you kind of, know the realism of what that feels like. Um, so I always feel like that's a good starting point and that's kind of how I go with the process. And I just put a one point on that. Yeah, There's this wonderful course. YouTube channel called The Take and it breaks down a bunch of tropes and you realize there are so many tropes. So there are so many holes to fall into, but The Take, they'll tell you about Okay. That. No, those, those are good resources. And I know on the Demon website, they have a list of books and um, other resources and podcasts you guys can listen to as well. And um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, some of these questions are repeated. Angela, uh, how does being an actor in film differ from being an actor in TV? Does one have any uh, advantages of the other? Should you focus on one? I don't know if there's like a huge difference anymore because everybody seems to be crossing over. You know, people have movie actors are doing TV shows and TV actors are doing movies. 
Um, I don't think I'm a particularly great person to ask because I think being on an indie film like Promising Young Woman is completely different to being on a Marvel film and I've never been on a Marvel film. So, uh, but what I will say is shooting television is can be insanely fun and fast paced when you're shooting outside in the real in the real elements instead of you know shooting in a sound stage because sometimes you'll go out there you'll be thrown into a ice cold river and you'll and the sun will be setting and you'll only get one take and then you know that goes out to the rest of the world forever <laughs> <laughs> so so that's tv for you okay and then wenny one last last question Sure. So I, I know anime is becoming huge. Like I see it all over Facebook, um, uh, subtle Asian traits. Everyone is watching anime. Um, but has the pandemic and the consequent rise of streaming, and I know anime is appearing in a lot of streaming now too, changed your marketing strategies or target audience? Um, I mean, anime as a medium is, is definitely exploding. It's on a global level. And I think it's, uh, you know, the... the it's interesting. I think a lot of people have asked us what the impact of the pandemic has been explicitly on our streaming component of our business. The truth of the matter is the, the growth rate that was happening for this medium as a whole, whether it's viewership, um, you know, merchandise, whatever the case may be, was already on a pretty insane uh, growth pattern. So um, I think when you, when you start to notice that the Netflixes of the world and the Amazons and Disney's and everybody else are paying attention, I think you start to understand what the impact of this particular medium is. So um, the pandemic certainly, I think, put the content in more people's laps, but that was a phenomenon that was already happening without, mm. um, without the, the current environment. Okay, yeah, the rise of international media stuff. And that is a good note to end on. So thank you so much, Gita, King, Wendy, and Angela. It really was an honor to moderate this um, discussion. I learned a lot, and I'm sure many other people did too. And now I'll toss it to Professor Kwan to wrap up tonight's episode. Wow, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists and um, everyone for tonight's conversation. This was so timely and immensely inspiring for all of our, us at Duke, uh, our students and also alumni who are hoping to break into the creative industry. So, um, and no matter what your age, that's the message I got. So um, follow your dreams. Um, this conversation also underscores the importance of creating more opportunities for diverse voices and stories to be told in their full humanity and all of our cultural industries. I so appreciate everything that you guys are doing and for showing up and for your courage to follow your bliss as Gita said, um, especially at this particular time, uh, so trying for many of our communities uh, under attack in the pandemic. So, so grateful for each of you. Thank you so much. Now it's time to announce the winner of our raffle. Drum roll, please. So the lucky winner of our raffle is Arjun Yagma, Yagna Muti, class of 2021. Congratulations, Arjun. Woo. So we will be in touch uh, by email so you can get your fabulous prize. And before we wrap, uh, we wanna extend our gratitude to the many collaborators from across Duke who have helped spread the word about this event. We had an amazing turnout. Thank you so much. You can stream tonight's conversation along with more episodes of Demon Live at the link. And also please don't forget to visit Asian American and Diaspora Studies website to sign up for our newsletter as well as the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance website. And uh, you can keep up uh, with upcoming events and stay connected to these communities. I wanna just highlight one uh, upcoming Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month keynote performance, uh, which is coming up on Saturday with Teresa Siagnatonu. She is an award-winning poet, teaching artist, mental health educator, and community organizer whose work focuses on the Pacific Islanders and indigenous rights and, and the LGBTQ communities, as well as uh, specifically uh, gender-based violence. So I uh, hope you can turn out for that. And uh, again, our statement of solidarity standing against Asian hate is available on our website and you can also sign them to show your own support. 
And so thank you again for joining us. Thank you, the panelists, Daniel, everyone. Until we meet again, stay safe and well. Bye, everyone.